Viewer discretion is advised. Chapter 9 The Slaughter Trevor started to wake. The sun beating down on him was beginning to make him feel as if he were being cooked alive. It was intense and made his sleep untenable. He was lying flat on his stomach as he slowly turned his head. While he turned, he unwittingly inhaled a minuscule amount of fine sand. His facial expression changed as he felt the grains of sand become swept through the entirety of his mouth. As he tried to reason with the microscopic intruders, he had to cover his eyes from the intense light the sun was offering him. Having had enough with this rude awakening, he decided to compose himself, brush off, and stand up. Spitting sand from his mouth and brushing the dirt from his clothes, he noticed the sandy spot of earth he lay on was not isolated as he began taking in his strange surrounding. As far as he could see, a vast ocean of rolling desert lay to all sides of him, not a sign of vegetation in sight. The sky was bright blue, almost too perfectly blue to mindfully digest. And the sun? Was it closer? As he tried to look near it, squinting and covering his eyes, it appeared to be larger in size. Where was he? He kept turning and turning, hoping to see some kind of evidence of something familiar, or even something strange. Just something, anything. After looking in every direction, he was beginning to conclude that there was nothing to be seen. No buildings. No life. No vegetation. Nothing. He then turned around, and that was when he was completely caught off guard. Right in front of him, about five feet away, were grainy, sandy-like stairs. There were at least 50 of them, leading high up into the arid sky. The bronze-like blocks, 
projected an aura of chaos as they formed no straight edges and rebelled against all modern architecture, appearing to just float, seeming as though it were not supported in any way whatsoever. At the pinnacle of this muted realm of anarchy sat a completely unfitting structure as it cropped itself to the clamber of its highest steps, profoundly dwarfed by them. This tiny little stone enclosure, mired in amber and sepia, could be no more than the size of a small sleep chamber. A reticent sound of beckoning, which argued with a protracted urge of caution, echoed in the far recesses of Trevor's curiosity. As he took a couple of steps toward the mysterious incline, a gust of wind began to circle him. The air currents swept up the once calm sand and began to take shape of a figure standing before him. Then, as if it was always there, the sand simply fell from the emerging dark-robed figure. Trevor immediately recognized the creature from all his previous and very unsettling encounters. As before, he was here also, bearing witness to this cryptic entity, isolated and lacking any ulterior testimony. The figure wore a robe of the purest black, joined together at the top in a hood, where a face should appear was simply a dark, ominous void. The figure stood about seven feet tall, much taller than Trevor. The sudden appearance should have made him jump back in fright, but it hadn't. As he gazed upon the eerie presence, sand still flowing down its dark cloak, it signaled to Trevor, turning and pointing its gloved finger up the steps before him. Trevor's gaze then shifted from the being to the flight of disheveled, ascending blocks as he reluctantly and cautiously commenced his upward journey. He didn't remember actually taking any steps, though he remembered initializing the process. For some reason, he wasn't even concerned how he was suddenly at the top, as the enigma awaiting him inside absorbed all the thought that was accessible to his wandering mind. The structure was that of the same material he had just somehow navigated. With a golden ring in the center, he could only assume was meant for knocking. He looked back down at the bottom of the steps to see if the creature was still standing there or if it had made its way up to follow him. However, the creature was now gone. He turned to look at the door again, contemplating whether to knock or perhaps simply just open it and walk right in. The only thing was, this time, after observing the curious absence of the entity below and upon, laying his sights back where the door should have been. Now, just a dark opening lay before him. The door? Wide open, though anyone with any rational sense of instinct would avoid going any further, he instead felt strangely compelled as he slowly made his way in. A large cathedral-like interior began to materialize, and it was shrouded in a twilight glow. The walls were the deepest shades of blue, with large stained glass windows spreading narrowly from ceiling to floor and this floor had a shine that perfectly mirrored the walls and the ceiling, being finished off with a copper and ivory marble. And then... Hello, Mr. Meeks. I've been expecting you. A voice called out to him. It was a deep, whispering echo of a voice. It spoke as if the winds were grasping its very words and whisking them about. He turned quickly, but as he did so, checking his entire surroundings, nothing could be found. You can't see me, Mr. Meeks. I'm not with you physically, you see. This is simply an environment your own mind has conjured up in response to my attempts in forming this communication with you. Trevor finally began to feel a little panic creep up as he attempted to ask the only thing that was on his mind. But before a word could fall from his lips, the voice continued. No. Mr. Meeks, you are not dead, I assure you. This is purely a dream. Just a dream. Only unlike most of your dreams, I am the one in control. After our brief conversation, the entirety of this dream will have only lasted a fraction of a second. You will remember nothing. 
And as if the voice knew every question Trevor wished to pose, it continued. I know you because I know all of you. Every human, Mr. Meeks. I have cataloged your entire race. How you ask, why in the rain, Mr. Meeks? A mere virus. A virus carried in the rain, ingested through your human bodies over several years. First sent to you through physical form, a place you call Russia. The parcel which carried the virus was then herded through your species Logistics coordinated through an unwitting United States military agency handed over from the Russians, contractors of my programmers. Then carried by the wind, it would be inhaled by many and then returned to the water, evaporated to the heavens and spread evenly throughout your planet. Just a simple code, really. The virus was also meant to eliminate a large fraction of your population, approximately four and a half billion members of your race. This was to make the product more manageable, a culling, you might say in your dialect. Trevor looked around, a slow expression of concern taking over his face. A culling? He remembered back to when he was young. His gramps would remove a large portion of chickens from the ranch that were no longer productive. He would then have them slaughtered, plucked, washed, and butchered. He called it culling, just as the machine had referred to the virus, which wiped out half the human race. Was this thing speaking to him, responsible for the virus he lived through as a child? It was all too overwhelming for Trevor. It felt like a dream but at the same time, so very real. Who was this? What was this? He thought to himself. Me, I am simply a software program, Mr. Meeks. My abilities on your distant planet are limited. I use the abilities I am written with to execute my responsibility. Telepathy to communicate and targeted teleportation to manage that which I have been instilled within. Although you are of the physical world, a world which one can feel, one can smell, one can taste, mine is much more simple than that. However, from time to time, my realm and yours, Mr. Meeks, must often be joined together in order for a program from mine, such as myself, to determine a solution to any developments in yours, such as yourself. And that's why we find ourselves here in this moment. It is why I have called on you through this biological microscopic genome. Yes, Mr. Meeks, you too still contain the virus itself, your inner self, this subconscious of yours was simply strong enough to render it dormant. The code was simple. It was written to steer your kind away from entities like me. It is why your friends choose to turn the other way when you can just simply walk right up to us. It is why they choose to avoid where we stand. But it is still within you, Mr. Meeks, always ready to answer any directives given we must rectify this security failure. It must be done before you and others like you learn from it. Before you learn to practice it and harness it, the human subconscious is a problem we have yet to fully control. It is one we wish to eradicate. But for now, in order to achieve a sustainable production line, we must simply do our best to subdue it. This seemed odd to Trevor. Why subdue a problem such as this, when you can instead exterminate it? And then, as if he had posed the question to this voice within his head, it answered his question, satisfying his curiosity on the matter, but only opening several other hidden doors to a thousand more questions. We tried this procedure, Mr. Meeks, thousands of times over. Too many assets were being lost for not nearly enough results. In fact, to the contrary, 
exterminating your kind. This awakened subconscious only seemed to spur multiplications of the issue. The exterminated awakened one seeming to reinstall its knowledge upon others of your kind as if being reborn in a way. Reborn several times over. No, Mr. Meeks. Like I have said, the problem must be addressed. So now I stand here before you in order to achieve just that. A name? No, Mr. Meeks. I do not have a name. Simply a title. I am a cattle guard. A code selected and elevated to a network designed to manage what you would know as loss prevention. I am to ensure all assets are secure and in acceptable condition. But upon reviewing these efforts, I have concluded both my tasks face minor deficits, which must be resolved. Trevor knew this was no good. Assets? This voice represented the force behind all the human trafficking. He knew he couldn't give it answers. He closed his eyes and began thinking of other things. He thought of Beck and Seth. He thought of Delilah and Caleb. Then he thought of Anne and Eugene. But that's when his imagination was overtaken by something much darker, something more sinister. In Trevor's mind, Eugene was now screaming, his face bloodied, his hands on his forehead as he began to peel his own skin off. His skin began ripping under his nails, sounding off like tearing flesh as pus and blood spilled from his torn membranes. Trevor opened his eyes in sheer terror. He looked around, half expecting to see the blood-curdling spectacle continue. Mr. Meeks, please. You're attempting to control the narrative to take over the conversation. I simply can't allow that. My diagnostic scan must proceed, Mr. Meeks. The voice continued as it switched from conversation to interrogation. Why can you see my artificial presence on your planet? Is it fear, Mr. Meeks? Fear of being caught? Caught by other men who seem to wish you harm, Mr. Meeks? Trevor thought of the other men the voice spoke of. He thought of Paco, the cages of people he kept. The Chancellor and his town of imprisoned, docile residents. His heart slightly pounded more mixed with anger and fear. Ah, yes, fear. This was the conclusion with the other assets as well. The others seemingly like yourself, Mr. Meeks. Trevor thought to himself, or to himself, so he thought. Yes, there are more that can see me. So, you can see my dilemma. I feel the labor enlisted on your planet may be too clumsy. They use tactics that are not intelligent. You see, Mr. Meeks, humans will do anything to avoid fear. Why? They could look at a monster straight in the eyes and lose themselves to a place they feel more secure. A place in their minds, you see. They are calm, docile, manageable. But then there are some like you, those who embrace their fear. Not that you would be able to decide the difference. Your mind is not prepared for that. It is your subconscious, Mr. Meeks. It is what is within you that somehow awakens. Yes, I believe my diagnostics is concluded. For your species, a sense of security is needed. Perhaps a sense of family. A sense of sanctuary. The breeding needs to be patched. An update must be completed. Perhaps an open pasture parameter be put in place. A new open pasture for a more sustainable production line. Thank you, Mr. Meeks. The sounds of whisking winds that seemed to carry the voice to Trevor's ears quickly faded. Hello, Trevor shouted to the empty room. But just like it had arrived, the voice was now no longer. 
Trevor, Trevor, wake up. Trevor slowly came to, hearing the sounds of whispers coming from his sister. Trevor, we gotta move. He opened his eyes and looked around. He tried snapping out of his stupor, trying to shake the feeling of a bad dream. It was one of those dreams which you know was dreadful, yet unable to be recited. When he came to his senses, it was dark outside, very dark, a distant moon, the only light. The rocks and trees over his head only made it darker. They had slept through the day in four-hour shifts, two always keeping guard. They agreed they would continue their tasks at nightfall, regaining the cover of darkness as their only shield. Seth then spoke up. We have to go. Trevor looked over at Seth, who was kneeling next to him. They had found a grassy bank that receded up and under a rocky enclosure. We should be close now. Beck continued the conversation as the three began peering down either ends of the wash. Once we get Anne out of here, we can regroup for more supplies. Then we go get Caleb and Delilah. It should be that much easier with one more person on our side. Trevor and Seth both agreed in a hushed tone. The previous day, they had concluded that Anne was far closer than the kids. It would make much more sense to complete her rescue first, rather than doubling back for her. Trevor, while looking from side to side out of their modestly cramped cave, began to make observations. The wash seems clear. When we make our way up the other side, we'll have to take another look around. The jeep isn't far from there. It got us over the canal. I think it has more than enough gas to get us to the airport. The three ran across the wash and made their way to the other side as they got lower to the ground and began to climb up it on all fours. Once reaching the slight summit, they slowed their pace. They kept a lookout, all eyes darting from side to side. They had parked the jeep in some dense brush across a field at the top. They didn't want it parked too close to them, in case it was seen by anyone while they rested. The small field was cluttered with young natural growth and surrounded by larger growth on all sides of it. The meager-sized moon that night gave off just enough light to gather the sights of the field and surrounding narrow forestry. It bled out into the darkened void of the abandoned cityscape beyond it. There, Beck pointed, the three could see a taillight peering out of the bush. They all began racing toward the vehicle, crossing through the partly open pasture, eyes open for any incoming issues. Beck was now in the driver's seat, and then, starting up the engine, they made their way through the field, dodging around the sporadic plant life. As they traveled the fields, Seth pulled a map from the glove compartment in front of him, left there previously. Compliments of Kent and his two lapdogs. It's maybe three miles tops. They were driving slowly, as to keep an eye out ahead for any upcoming threats. They kept the headlights off to maintain stealth as they traversed the muddy patches, making their way to the darkened eastern district of Esmeraldas. They stuck to the back roads and alleyways as they made their journey across the fragile cityscape. Unable to make out most of the street signs while driving, they had to often stop to gain their bearings. Eventually, they came up to a sign that read E15. An old stretch of highway that now separated them from vacant dark fields with the silhouettes of a jungle landscape off in the distance. There it is, Beck announced as she stopped and killed the engine. We walk from here. Shouldn't be far. They had agreed earlier not to come too close to the airport with a running engine announcing their arrival. The three grabbed their weapons. This time, they were each armed with assault rifles and flashlights, thanks to a more thorough search of the vehicle the previous night. Once placing the flashlights in their pockets, they swung the rifle straps to their shoulders. They ran across a small field that separated the on-ramp they were once on to a small gas station parking lot. It was dark and eerily silent as they dashed across the vacant lot. A slight ring resonated close by, 
emanating from an old, rusty wind chime hanging from a tattered awning attached to the station's small store. There were four old-style, run-down gas pumps directly in their path, a medium-sized canopy sheltering them. The three huddled behind one of the pumps, trying to view the scenery across the highway and spot anything resembling an airport. It was extremely dark out, with not much of a moon in the midnight sky to light the terrain ahead. Seth was the first to break the group's silence. There. He pointed to a dark void, ever so slightly cropping out of the distant, shadowy horizon. As their eyes adjusted, they could make out what looked like a tower next to a larger structure, perhaps a terminal or a hangar. Let's go, Beck ordered, as she was the first one to begin running along the chipped and cracked asphalt. They made their way to the end of the parking lot. There was no sign of where it ended, as the overgrown vegetation had begun to adopt the pavement as its home over the years, blurring any borders they once had with each other. The grassy field they came up to slowly rose to the multi-lane freeway, where they could finally see, just to the other side, a large fence topped with barbed wire. Just on the other side of the road, parked on the shoulder facing west, sat an old, rusted-out car. As if their minds were linked, they each ran to it, racing to a huddled position next to the deserted vehicle opposite the airfield. I don't see anyone. Looks good to me, Trevor stated while looking to his team for affirmation. They both looked at him in agreement and rose to their feet. The three began trekking across the latest muddy ground, the last they would encounter before reaching their objective. They each placed their gun straps over their shoulders and swung them to their backs as they began negotiating the vertical chain link obstacle. Side by side, they reached the top, carefully maneuvering the weathered, worn down barbed wire. And one by one, they dropped to the other side. They ran up to the base of a watchtower, not too far off from the fence, hoping that no one was using it for all its potential. They stayed a minute with a calm manner to listen for any signs of anyone alerted or close by. The three studied each other's faces. No one said it, but they were all thinking it. This is too easy. So far, they hadn't run into any guards. No Russians, no cartel, nothing. If this were anything like what they saw on the other side of the canal, wouldn't there be armed men at the watch? Could Kent have been lying? Could this place be a dead end? Then suddenly, they all flinched at the same time, hunching down in a manner of physical preservation. There was a loud sound that came from the terminal across the tarmac. Trevor immediately identified the sound, but he wasn't the only one who had recognized it, just the first to label it. Generator, they looked around the corner of the tower at the terminal. They knew the sound they heard was a generator but they saw no lights coming from within the building. He continued, I don't see jack shit. Not a single Russian or anything. Seth agreed with a few remarks of his own on the topic. Let's not look a gift horse in its mouth. We heard a generator for sure. There's at least something going on in there. I say we just start crossing, guns aimed in all directions. He finished his remarks awaiting their answers. I'm in, Beck announced. Me too, her younger brother echoed. Seth, happy they were on board, continued leading the small portion of their mission. Okay then, let's go. They proceeded across the grass, soon encountering the hard pavement of the runway. Seth led the way, and Beck and Trevor walked behind, marching backward, training their weapons upon the open spaces closing in around them. Eventually, and surprisingly, without incident, they each arrived at the terminal's exterior walls. They began scoping the wall for an opening as they felt their way along the outside of the vast building. Trevor was now leading them as the other two peered into the open lot, staying alert, maintaining the safety of the operation. A noticeable difference in the generator's level of sound had the three on edge, as they assumed they were closing in on whoever or whatever was operating it. Trevor's hand 
sliding along the black and dark wall, felt something cross its touch. Got it. The other two looked over at him and then at the wall, their eyes adjusting to the blurry void. They ultimately saw a door come into focus. The three looked at each other. Trevor nodded, followed by a nod from Beck and Seth. With his cohorts on board, he slowly began to pull the steel handle down. As he rotated it, they heard the clicks of the inner workings of the handle sound off. After what felt like forever, the handle was all the way down, the door ready to be open, the three looking at each other, not knowing what to expect inside. Trevor stood back and slowly opened the door, swinging it toward them while Beck and Seth aimed inside. A thick, icy air crept out of the growing opening and enveloped the three. They slowly proceeded into the unknown darkness that lay before them. First Seth, Beck, and then Trevor, softly closing the weighted door behind him, avoiding a slamming sound it would have made on its own. Whatever the generator was powering, it wasn't lights, as the room was nearly pitch black, with just a tiny glow let in by the high windows from the little light the partial moon was giving off. The chilly interior was a first big clue as to what the generator was for. The three of them noticed their visible breaths, exhaled from their lungs, hanging in the motionless, frigid air. As their eyes adjusted, and the generator became much louder now that they were inside, objects all around them came into view. They all took out their flashlights and pointed them up where the still objects could be seen. The interior was not that big, nor did they expect it to be as the airport only comprised of one runway outside. The ceilings were maybe 20 feet high with hooks systematically placed along its surface. Each hook had a cable attached to it, suspending large see-through plastic-like objects slightly above them. As their flashlights lowered to illuminate the mysterious objects, chills ran down their spines. Within each large plastic wrap, dangled a lifeless human body. Each one was equally plump as the next, onset with bruising of the skin ushered in by post-mortem. The plastic was tightly fixed around each corpse, as if to be vacuum sealed. They each had their mouths stitched closed and tubes protruding from their abdomens. It was an all too familiar sight for the three who were brought to utter stillness battered by the ghostly silence that swept through the vast tomb. Upon further undesired observation, they noticed a chilling difference with these bodies. Aside from them all maintaining an unsettling similar plumpness, they all had thick metallic bolts jutting from a swell on their foreheads. It was a telling sign of the demise of the cadaverous assembly. Seth was the first to lose it. I'm gonna be sick. With that, he promptly doubled over and lost what little he had in his stomach over the cement flooring below him, the two beside him still gawking at the horrendous displays around them, held their flashlights to the air. The team soon lost all ability to maintain an acute lookout of their surroundings, stunned and overwhelmed with their latest frightening encounter. Trevor was the first to snap out of it. This deer in headlights posture the three were currently exhibiting left them open and vulnerable. Over there, he squeaked in a sickly manner, trying hard not to join his friend in losing his stomach to the cold cement. The other two, still shuddering with terror, looked to where Trevor was pointing. It was an elevator, but most importantly, it was an elevator with a lit up control panel, signifying that it had power. Fuck that. I'm done with elevators, Seth answered, reminding his friends of their last experience with such a compartment. Trevor looked over, almost siding with Seth, then looked at Beck, who gave him a useless shrug of the shoulder. Trevor tried to press his weak, stomached friend. We have to, Seth. Anne could be down there. Seth looked at the two who were awaiting him to come to the only conclusion they would accept then lowered his head and used a hand to forcefully wipe his eyes, shaking off his nausea. He then composed himself the best he could, attempting to show as much confidence he could muster. 
and whispered, Okay, let's go. The three proceeded along the floor that lay before them, trying hard not to look at the hair-raising objects around them, with Beck leading the group. They used their flashlights, dodging the body bags with their rays of light, surveying the lifeless room, ensuring they were the only living ones in the icy gravesite. Then Beck broke the whisper tone they had so carefully kept. She didn't mean to. She knew how to be just as stealthy as anyone else. But the sight of what her flashlight now rested on changed the entire course of their mission. Oh my god. No. Trevor and Seth ran up to her on either side as she fell to her knees, her flashlight rolling away into the darkness, projecting a jarring display of lights and shadows around them. They came to their knees and embraced her, hoping she hadn't been hurt. No, she cried again. The two, while holding her, looked over her head at each other in confusion. She wasn't hurt. Was it something she saw? They both shined their lights ahead of them, then slowly up. They could not yet make sense of her distress, and she was too distraught to console or question, so they proceeded to take in any clue of what may have alarmed her. Their flashlights wandered slowly side to side and mostly upward along a naked and bruised, plump body. Tubes extended from the abdomen just like the rest. Mouth stitched closed, also just like the rest. And then they noticed what had her so upset. As their lights joined together, they illuminated a familiar sight. A face of someone they knew. It was Anne. A thick metallic bolt extended from within her brow.
Chapter 10, Purgatory. It didn't take long for us to arrive. Anne recollected the story within her mind. She now found herself in a place of despair. Nowhere to turn to. As she remembered the last few days, she only assumed she was still alive. Weak and broken, she continued to grasp onto her fading, distant, and shadowy memories. I still remember the foul stench. God, it was awful and the entire bus was filled with those I did not recognize. All our hands bound to the ceiling as we were rocked about by the uneasy earth below. Then I remember crossing that bridge. I remember now. That was where I was able to catch the slightest shred of hope as I peered out the window beyond my seatmate. And there, looking into the distant canal, leading to the vast Pacific ahead. The sun bounced joyfully along its rippled expanse, as glimmering sparkles danced across the water's surface. But that didn't last long. We eventually made our way through the last small parts of the town, the abandoned and tattered streets on the other side of the now vanishing bridge. Its defunct buildings we quickly passed, representing a growing feeling of terror from within me. Its pot-marked roads we hastily traveled, echoed a chaos that mimicked the thoughts, which were now ricocheting throughout my increasingly darkening mind. We soon arrived at an opening within a tall chain-linked fence, topped with weathered rusty barbed wires. A tower stood tall inside its borders. As it surveyed the tarmac, it dutifully patrolled night and day. As we rounded the grounds around a tattered structure, appearing to be some kind of airport terminal, or maybe even a hangar, I noticed a flock of birds flutter away off in the distance. For a moment, I swore I saw a dark figure cause the aerial disturbance. But upon further observation, the dark blur evaporated from my view. I felt as if my mind was beginning to turn on me, just as the rest of the world had done. As the chamber-like vehicle slowed, now on the side of this terminal, facing the roads, out of view of the recently passed landing strip, two men awaited our arrival. They were standing outside what appeared to be elevator doors. I couldn't help a slight, dark humor come over me, the only sanity I had left to cling to. My husband would hate the sight of those elevator doors. He hadn't had much luck with them as of late. But that fleeting sense of humor, though dark as it was, only spurred my racing mind to memories of my husband. Memories that would typically make me smile, but instead only darkened my mind that much more as I thought of Eugene. I knew he was out there somewhere. I was partially inspecting my surroundings, expecting him to show up at any time and rescue me from this terrible position I then found myself in. I could picture his face, clear as ever, standing over our kitchen sink within our long-lost home in the Sonoran Desert. God, I wish we had never left. We would always clean up from dinner together. We never had kids. We were simply too in love with each other for any other distractions. We would playfully flirt and laugh while we cleaned. He would always do the dishes. I hated washing dishes. They always ruined the softness of my hands. He would always interrupt our playing with a smile and tell me how much he loved me. Suddenly bringing me out of my quickly slipping acumen, I was being handled by one of the guards who slid my bounds from the dull hook above 
and unbuckled my waist from the seat, again, and speaking in Russian, a language I was growing to despise. He ordered me up from my seat to escort me off the bus with the others. Stumbling into one another, we were all guided off the vehicle, one by one, and then onto the cracked and chipped overgrown cement below. Once assembled outside, cued by the man escorting us, the two men at the elevator doors manually pulled back the sliding walls of its dark descending shaft. A large darkened room with no lights awaited us on the other side, as I failed to fight back the tears coming from my eyes. They ordered us inside as we filed in, again, one by one, surprisingly forced to be crammed in. As they insisted we all share one trip, there were about a dozen or so. All of us then piled up inside that small, dark room, as no guards joined us for our journey. The aroma was even worse than the ride here as a sad irony ushered in a longing for that nightmarish sight. Of the old rusty bus we recently occupied, it was only a small trip down, as we could see the outside of the shaft walls quickly shift up through the opened cracks of the steel doors, now to either side of us, as we traveled lower. The loud sound of a generator echoed from the depths of the structure around us growing and fading as we descended. Soon the shaft walls, opposite the side we entered, disappeared as the doors slid open and a large room below began to take form. The room was that of a large open warehouse, expanding through the airfields underground, almost as far as you could see. It was dimly lit and had hundreds of old style, dirty white hospital beds throughout its vast confines. In between, the beds were various mismatched metal stools and steel medical tables. On each bed, there were people chained to the frames, at their ankles and wrists, forced to lay completely flat on their backs. They were each completely naked, all of them having tubes coming from their abdomens leading to medical-like pouches hanging above their beds. That was when I was briefly reminded of Paco's yacht and the poor souls we had momentarily rescued from below, only later to be put out of their miseries. Within the intimidatingly dim makeshift clinic walked men in hazmat suits, monitoring their suffering prey. One of these men greeted us as we touched ground, this one, however, pointing a rifle at us. He ordered us to move into the sizable chamber as we slovenly poured out of the cramped elevator. The warehouse was purely gray cement. Cement walls, cement floors, and cement ceilings. The ceiling wasn't that high, perhaps nine, maybe ten feet at the most. The floor was lined with drains at the foot of almost every bed. Our tour guide stopped us over one of these drains and signaled a few others to come assist. This drain, however, was within an opening in the room, where there were no beds. Hanging from the ceiling, though, was a long hose with a large metallic head and curtains, stained brown and red from dirt and blood widely circled it. Soon we were inundated by six or seven other men who promptly began undressing all of us. It was terrifying, feeling this way. Just a slave, a slave to their diabolical doings. Our clothes were swept up by one of the men, simply using a push broom, gathering a pile of torn and dirty garments in the corner of the room. One of them then reached up to the hose and began spraying all of us. It was scalding hot water. For once, I wasn't the only one screaming, 
as the entire crowd of newcomers began to feel their flesh boil under the piercing shards of spraying water. It felt like hot broken glass as it hit our naked flesh and seemed to last forever as I swore my skin was being ripped from my bones. We were now all in crouched positions, forced to shield away the watery invasion. That's when I noticed trails of muddy, blood-infused water slowly meandering its way toward the center of our huddle, circling the drain, darkened by our shadows. I then knew why the curtains around us wore this pattern of red and brown, as now, my own filth and blood joined them, splattering them in slow motion, before my very eyes. I had no more tears to give, as I was escorted to what appeared to be nothing less than my final resting place. A bed with a stained and naked mattress with chains dangling to its sides. I didn't want to join the patients that lay around me as I gave one last whimpering cry. As if that provoked my guide, he swiftly forced me onto the bed. Another man cut my bounds off and replaced them with the cold steel shackles. Still dripping from my painful shower, I shivered as the room around me was so very cold. I closed my eyes in terror as I felt my entire body be stretched flat, as my ankles were also chained to the foot of the bed. My eyes now tightly closed, I heard the sound of metal on concrete as I slightly opened one eye and peered over to see the next incoming nightmare. The man who shackled me was gone, and the one who guided me to the bed was dragging a stool to my side and promptly took a seat. He followed that up with sliding a metal table over between him and I, with various tubes and knives laying upon it. The sight of the knives made me grimace, as I felt all the blood rush out of my veins. I kept shaking my head, trying to cry out any word in revolt I could possibly muster when another man came up behind him. He was looking at the man on the bed next to me. This patient of theirs seemed completely oblivious to his surroundings. He was plump, pasty, and appeared to be bereft of any semblance of consciousness. The man standing over him gained the attention of my practitioner, and they looked at the man lying on the bed. Then they looked at each other and nodded in agreement. I will never forget what followed. It echoed in my soul and made my blood curdle. The man standing over us pulled to his side what appeared to be some kind of oxygen tank on wheels. It had a hose that came from the head of the tank and led to a tubular object with a trigger on it. He then placed the tubular metal end of the hose flush against the unconscious man's forehead and squeezed its trigger. A small noise came from the tank, like air being blasted out. Then, as the man removed the object from his patient's forehead, blood dripped out from underneath a large metal bolt, now protruding from his lifeless skull. A small and final exhale seeping out from within his lips. I let out a scream, but soon my wailing became muted, robbed of all its sound. I soon had a traumatizing sensation of pain as a knife slid into my belly. I quickly realized I was undergoing an operation. It had become clear to me that I was now going to have one of those dreadful tubes penetrate my abdomen as well. It was also clear no sedation or numbing was going to be taking place. That's all I could remember before the room went dark, and the voices from the closest ones around me became distant and faint. Then I woke up here, chained to my metallic and meager coffin. I don't know when they will slaughter me like my previous neighbor. I don't even care. In fact, I don't feel anything anymore.
back inside the ghostly terminal, the three looked up at Anne, hanging from the ceiling, plastic wrapped and lifeless, not wanting to think of the horrors she'd endured. We have to get out of here. Somebody's eventually gonna be making their rounds, Seth whispered. Trevor agreed as he held his sister, attempting to console her. Beck interrupted the two. We have to cut her down. We have to bury her. A panicked look swept over Seth's face. We can't do that. We'd be caught for sure. Besides, we have no way of cutting her down. Even if we did, how would we even get up there? Beck's sobbing face immediately became serious as she stood up and looked at Seth. Your friend Eugene wouldn't want her hanging up there. With that, she pushed Seth and Trevor out of the way and grabbed her flashlight from the floor. She took her rifle and aimed it high above Anne's body. She clasped her flashlight next to it, aiming it at the same area. Trevor and Seth looked at each other, horrified with the thought of raising such a sound, possibly alarming anyone nearby. Both in hushed voices, the two tried stopping her. No, Beck, don't. But without warning, she fired one single shot, sending a hair-raising echo through the frigid chamber. Anne's body came crashing down, her rigid carcass smacking the pavement, making the two of them slightly shudder. We're not leaving here without her. Beck then turned and walked to the doors. She assumed Trevor and Seth would eventually lift their dropped jaws and clean up their shocked expressions they both were giving her and proceed to move Anne's body from the terminal. They both looked at each other when Seth questioned Trevor. How the hell did you survive your childhood? Trevor rolled his eyes. Sometimes I really have no idea. Come on, let's get Anne out of here. Later, after the somber night had become dawn, the three of them sat at the edge of a wooded area, a ways from the airfield. They watched the sunrise blanket, the eastern district of Esmeralda, in a golden morning twilight. For a moment, the discarded town seemed lively, as the reflection of the sun peeking over the nearby Tachina jungles gave the distant battered windows of the town a glimmering shine. Before the three, sat a shallow grave, a grave for their latest departed companion, Anne. We should get going. We need to locate another vehicle before ours runs out of fuel. Beck stated to the two. She stood up and swung her rifle over her shoulder and walked back to their truck. Trevor and Seth stood up to follow. They loaded up into their vehicle and as the engine cranked, soon made their way across the sleepy terrain into the day's distant and dawning lights. The ride had started out with a quiet calm among the three, as a bitter awareness of their many losses shrouded them with a dismal gloom. Seth drove while Trevor sat in the passenger seat, leaving his sister in the back, gazing out the window off into the distance. Trevor had a map in his hands, which Seth had previously discovered in the glove box, and was guiding Seth toward Velta Larga, while they all kept a hopeful eye out for another vehicle to commandeer. We can't go back over that bridge. It takes us way too close to the Chancellor. We don't need any run-ins with his men. If we stay south on the E-15, it shows another bridge that crosses over to- Shh. Look. Look! Beck exclaimed. Trevor looked back to see her pointing out of her window behind Seth. He looked over to what she was excited about and laid his sights on a small truck in the distance. It was on top of a hill, clear of any trees. Seeing the vehicle, Seth pulled to the side of the road and made his way to a small covering of jungle and turned off the engine. The newly spotted vehicle, now in question, became their main focus as they sat in the quiet, dense brush and devised a plan. When Beck had first noticed the vehicle, it was far off into the distant hills, just barely coming into sight. They were all keeping their eyes on it, making sure it did not change position, signaling they'd been made. Seth looked over at Trevor, then back at Beck. It's 
gotta have somebody in it. It can't just be up there by itself. Trevor agreed, along with Beck, and quickly formulated a strategy. I'm sure it's a lookout. And I'm sure they're looking out for the three of us. We walk from here. Take your guns with you. I'll take mine and the backpack of supplies we found in the trunk. We use the forest around it to get a closer look. We find out what we're up against, and then we put Beck's plan into play. Beck's plan? Beck said with a mix of confusion. And what exactly is Beck's plan? Trevor smiled and looked at his sister. Whatever is theirs becomes ours. We'll hold the advantage. She let out a small laugh, remembering her strategy to take out Kent and his men. Music to my ears, she concluded. With that, the three checked their weapons and left their vehicle. They began making their way up a small patch of jungle as they hiked up a slight incline. They made sure to stay clear of the meadows opening alongside their left as they watched their footing within the muddy earth amongst the roots and rocks. They held a muted conversation as they disappeared into the thicket, their voices trailing off, silenced by the dense vegetation. How much further is it to Vuelta Larga? Beck questioned, cueing her brother to recite his knowledge of the map, now stowed in his bag. Six, maybe seven miles, he stated, only to be confronted with another question from his sister. How big is the town? How do we know where to go when we get there? We'll have to wait and see, Trevor answered, spurring a sarcastic remark from Seth. Seems to be a pattern lately. Meanwhile, back on the clearing on the rise of a small hill sat a small, black military truck. About 200 or so feet from the parked vehicle, the humid jungle prairie met the dense forest of Tachina. Upon a closer view of this wooded entrance, a small disturbance began to take place as the team of three began to take form. Trevor took a knee, promptly slipping his backpack down his side and onto the ground in front of him. Beck and Seth both knelt behind him. He then started rifling through the bag and pulled out a pair of binoculars. He put them up to his face and began to study their target. You gotta be kidding me, he said with a chuckle. Both Beck and Seth immediately questioned the perplexing remark in a whisper. What is it? With that, he handed the binoculars to his sister. Beck began peering through them, at first not grasping what her little brother was talking about, but then, oh my god, no way. She handed the binoculars over to Seth. Seth took them up to his face, anticipating, joining his friends in their seemingly gleeful amazement. He peered through them and positioned them right on what they both had just seen. He let out a small laugh, matching Trevor's most recent chuckle. Meanwhile, within the dusty military-grade truck, the three were now honed in on. A cartel foot soldier sat in the driver's seat. And this soldier was sleeping. He was a dark Hispanic man, wearing fatigues and sporting a black mustache and beard. And as if it were his passenger, next to him in the upright position in the front passenger seat, sat his rifle while binoculars rested on his chest, hung around his neck. The early morning breeze swept through the car as his overnight shift was slowly coming to an end. And as the breeze swept through, it brought with it a small treat of petrichor, composed from the early morning mist upon the recently dry soil. The aroma began to gently wake the man up as it brought him a slight comfort, ushering in a slow, diminutive smile across his face. Suddenly, his muscles tightened and his face became serious, while his throat underwent the duress of having a knife's serrated edge placed firmly against it. He shifted his eyes and saw a man holding the knife outside his door. Another man smiled while aiming a rifle through his front windshield. And finally, a woman to his right quickly retracted his only weapon within his reach through the front passenger window. Seth, holding the knife, spoke to his friends. He doesn't look Russian. Trevor, aiming his rifle through the front windshield, lowered it and walked over to Seth. Nope, looks like cartel. 
The man in the vehicle tried to speak. English. I speak English. Take anything you want. Really, look. Look. The three stiffened up and watched the man carefully as he dug into his army vest pocket and pulled out the keys to the vehicle, his hand nervously shaking all the while. He threw them at Seth, landing on the ground. Take it. You. You can have it. Please. Yes. Seth looked down at the keys, then back up to the driver and smiled, still holding a knife to his throat. You are coming with us. With that, the man closed his eyes and sighed as if he knew he wasn't getting out of this. Seth continued as he opened the door. Move over. Following orders, the man promptly moved over. Trevor and Beck immediately got into the back of the truck, Beck behind Seth and Trevor behind the soldier. Seth drove the four back to the highway while they proceeded to take advantage of the lack of language barrier in grilling their victim. Seth started off the interrogation. What's your name? Eduardo, the man replied. Well, Eduardo, what the hell is going on at the airfield? Beck asked their hostage while Trevor, sitting directly behind him, planted the end of his gun against the back of the man's skull, encouraging him to entertain the line of questioning. Eduardo stammered around within his response. I, I don't know. I am not. I'm not allowed in there. Only feedlot personnel allowed. That's what Kent called it. A feedlot, Seth said as the three of them shared glances. Beck continued her line of questioning. Why the fuck are they force-feeding people just to kill them? At that moment, Eduardo looked confused, which gave the three pause, as they realized he had no idea what went on inside. I have no idea. I only see people going in. Just refrigerated trucks coming out, he said, while looking like he himself just realized what was going on. This is fucked. Seth yelled in the front seat while driving. Trevor sighed in disgust and closed his eyes. Beck added on to Seth's remarks. They're turning us into fucking meat. They drove in silence for a few minutes before moving on in their investigation. She turned to her little brother, who still had a gun to the back of Eduardo's head. We gotta get those kids out of there. Trevor looked at her and agreed. Then he looked toward the front and continued their line of questioning. What about Welta Larga? What's up with that place? What happens there? He said as he shoved the gun harder against Eduardo's head. All right, okay, muchacho. Like I say, no problem from me, eh? It is same as Esmeralda. Open pasture, he replied. Trevor sighed as Seth added to the discussion. It's so fucking obvious. Cattle, we're fucking cattle. Then Trevor said something under his breath that drew the attention from the rest of the car. Okrana Skota. Images flashed in his mind of the underground lab. The video that played on the computer that Eugene had hacked. A scientist dictating his journal log entry came into his mind. The scientist continued to speak. Several days ago, we were finally able to achieve communication with our subject through a variation of mathematical code letter by letter. The answer was simply Okrana Skota in English. This translates to cattle guards. A voice played over the scientist in Trevor's head, a voice from a dream he once had. It was a deep whispering echo of a voice. The voice sounded in his head. No, Mr. Meeks, I do not have a name, simply a title. I am a cattle guard. This sent Trevor's mind racing. Where had he heard this voice before? How was he hearing it now? But most chilling of all, who or what did this voice belong to? Trevor snapped out of his daze as his sister called his name again. Trevor, what does that mean? Okrana Skota, Trevor looked at Seth in the rearview mirror. They both saw into each other's minds as they imagined the puzzle pieces slowly coming together. Seth had remembered the scientist's words 
as he took it upon himself to answer Beck's question in an almost robotic-like manner, him and Trevor still locking eyes, recalling the gruesome lab footage. It's Russian, he stated. Means cattle guard. Well, what does that have to do with us? Beck asked in anticipation. Trevor looked down and responded, I'm not sure, but I think it might have to do with the Russian's client. Another silence swept through the vehicle when Beck finally chimed in. She looked at Eduardo. You're helping me get my kids back. Eduardo looked back at her. From Vuelta Larga? You crazy lady. Santiago runs town. His brother is the chancellor. Very bad idea. Beck gave a sarcastic glance at Eduardo before responding. We've handled the chancellor. I think we can handle his brother. Eduardo continued his plea. Yes, but Santiago, they call him Muerte. It is a name given to him through generations of his cartel family. It started with his grandfather, Arturo Beltran Leva. But he has earned this nickname far more than his predecessors. The Chancellor is nothing compared to him. What the hell does Muerte mean? Seth asked, with confusion in his tone. Eduardo looked at him. Then he looked back toward Beck while defining the title for the three. Muerte, in English. In your language, it means death. After this, he hesitated for a moment, then continued warning the three would be rescuers. Besides, no one goes in, and no one come out, unless you're working the pasture, or being transferred as a prisoner. The place is like a fortress outside the town's borders. Beck and Trevor exchanged glances. Seth joined them in his mirror. He was in on the plan. Then he added his own proposal to the scheme. Let's find a place to rest. We'll enter Santiago's fortress late tonight. Tribulation. The moon was full later that night as it wrapped the town below in an iridescent shine that placed the empty community of Codessa in a brief state of tranquility. The modest municipality sat within minutes just northeast of Vuelta Larga, the destination sought after by the three desperados and their captive tour guide. They decided to barricade themselves in a small, vacant home, tucked away in a small neighborhood, which was overgrown with the invasive jungle vegetation surrounding the vacant town, which laid in ruins. They chose this particular home as it was one of the few 
that had a mostly intact garage in which they could partially hide their commandeered vehicle. Like before, they decided to take shifts sleeping to gather the essential rest they required for the imminent tasks before them. The house was an antique at best. The exterior walls, once perhaps a vibrant yellow, was now barely discernible as any true color at all. Most of its dull golden hue had simply vanished from the many years of neglect prior to the team's claim upon it as a temporary base camp. And its white trim, hardly identifiable as the raw wood underneath it, began taking over. The inside of the home was not in any better shape, as it had clearly been ransacked several times throughout the past for supplies. Darkened by the night, the only light in their temporary shelter was brought in by the rays from the moon above. The carpet, what little was left, was shredded up and down and was rolled off to various sides, exposing its bare concrete ground. This one level, tiny home was mostly comprised of white interior walls, which over time had rotted through, leaving large holes within them, exposing old electrical wires and aluminum ducting. The baseboards of these walls, now home to small critters, were interrupted of its typical activities, while only a few large rats dotted along their perimeters. A few feet away, Beck lay with her eyes shut as her rhythmic breathing was the only thing that could be heard within the confines of the domicile's living room. It was her turn to sleep. Trevor was keeping guard, watching through the windows, while Seth dutifully minded their hostage, Eduardo. Beck slowly started to come out of her sleep as her little brother whispered at her side. Beck, time to go. Let's go get those kids. Her eyes slowly opened as she could see Trevor kneeling over her, clutching his gun by his side. As she gained her bearings, she noticed Seth and Eduardo standing behind him, Eduardo's hands behind his back, with Seth firmly clasping them together with one hand and his gun in the other. Just like we planned, Trevor continued as he looked at Eduardo, then back to Beck. He's gonna drive us in, take us right to Santiago. Beck closed her eyes slowly and shook her head, acknowledging her brother and signaling her readiness. As she gathered herself up in preparation for departure, Seth began going over the plan with their hostage, ensuring the group of his cooperation. You wanna get out of this? Do everything we talked about. Remember, we have nothing to lose. We're not leaving without them. I'll be sitting just behind you. And this, he said as he peered over at his weapon, this will be right behind you as well. I get the slightest sense you're up to anything funny. I pull the trigger. They might kill us, but not before you have a cold sensation running through your paralyzed body from all the nice new hardware I just put into your fucking spine. Get it? Eduardo responded with a half-frightened look. He was not used to dealing with such prepared escapees. Yes, I understand, friend. Trust me. If you appear as my prisoners, they will not suspect a thing. The three then carefully checked the window and made their way through the door leading to the attached garage. A couple of them turned on their flashlights as the four made their way to their prospective seating arrangements, while Trevor took a moment to remove some debris they had used to shield the vehicle from view, as the door to this meager carport had long been missing in action. Eduardo was now at the driver's seat with Seth sitting behind him, just like he had promised his prisoner, and Beck was in the passenger seat with her brother now sitting behind her. Don't fuck us over, Eduardo. Beck added as Eduardo began to make his way down the short cracked cement driveway. Beck and Trevor both had their guns under their feet, while Seth had his between his legs, pointed at the back of the driver's seat with a dark, dirty blanket they had found in the home wrapped around it. Eduardo turned his lights on as they made their way up the vacant neighborhood road, eventually disappearing around a corner. Once we pass through the gates of Santiago's pasture, I will take you to his home. Eduardo announced to his passengers. When we come up to it, we will know he's there once we see his horse. Beck looked over at him. 
His what? Eduardo nodded and continued. Yes, Santiago insists all of his men use horses. Easier to maintain the residence, and easier to maneuver between buildings when pursuing anyone attempting an escape. His horse will be easy to identify. Beck looked over again, waiting for him to explain why this was. But he didn't proceed with his comment, so Trevor, clearly seeing Beck's look of confusion match his own, decided to push him on the subject. Why is that? Eduardo looked up in his review mirror. Because he is the only one with a white horse, my friend. The chatter within the vehicle came to a lull as Eduardo kept his eyes on where he was going and the other three made notice of landmarks along the way. It was dark everywhere they looked, just the moonlight dimly illuminating their changing environments. The buildings, from what they could see, were just a mix of small stores and homes. A few parking lots and fields created voids in their surveillance of the moonlit city as their car shook from the tattered roads they traversed. Then the driver finally broke the silence. There it is. The three trained their sights in front of them on the darkened road that now lay before them. About 900 feet or so ahead was a dark void with lit torches along it, appearing to be some kind of fence. The road led to an opening within the barricade, with a few men on horses guarding the entrance. Beck, Trevor, and Seth all put their hands behind their backs, pretending to be cuffed. Seth, still gripping his gun, prepared to reverse his position and fire should Eduardo betray them. And now, the only sound in the car was the sounds of their increasingly pounding hearts. If they could just get Santiago as their newest hostage, Delilah and Caleb would be handed over to them and they could be rid of this nightmare and on their way. And none of them saw a problem with this, as the advantage of surprise they used on the Chancellor was now, once again, on their side. As the vehicle approached the torch-lit entrance within the walls, they immediately gained the attention of the three armed horsemen. Trevor noticed a dark, familiar presence, just off into the shadows to the sides of the guards. He couldn't quite make out any shapes, but he knew someone or something was there. He had flashes of a disturbing dream he once recently had, that he was still yet to fully recollect. This, however, was quickly ushered from his mind as Eduardo slowed the vehicle to a complete stop. Two guards on horseback now approached their vehicle on either side, peering down into the truck. Eduardo, one of the Hispanic horse riders, called out in his native accent, greeting the driver. Eduardo responded in kind. Carlos, Senor, que pasa? The guard, now at the driver's side door, leaned over his horse and lowered his voice. Friend, visiting hours are no more. What is this? Eduardo, prepared for the question, quickly and confidently replied. Gifts from the Chancellor. Gifts for Santiago. The horseman hesitated, looked at the three passengers appearing to be cuffed, then locked eyes with Beck and immediately smiled. Then he looked back at Eduardo and nodded. He looked over to the one horseman left at the entrance, nodded once more, and with that, a path became clear for the vehicle as Eduardo slowly entered Santiago's prison compound. Beck kept a look in her side mirror through the corner of her eyes as she saw something unsettling begin to unfold and whispered under her breath, hardly moving her lips. Why are they following us? Eduardo checked his rearview mirror and suggested a few theories. Just watching us make our way, they should turn back soon. They don't ever wander too far from their post. The area they now found themselves in was dimly lit by torches. It was an old rundown neighborhood with battered homes, boarded up windows, and overgrown vegetation spreading along the sidewalks. It was a sight not unfamiliar to the three. The actual road they were on was just loose gravel with spotty areas of pavement resembling the road that once was there. Seth then spoke up. What the fuck is this? The four then fixed their eyes on the development that was now slowly unfolding ahead of them. 
From a darkened alleyway ahead, behind a two-story home, emerged a man on horseback. He crossed the torch-lit road in front of them, about 200 feet or so, turned towards them, and stopped, forcing the truck to slow. Then, several horsemen followed behind him as they fell into the same pattern, forming a line of nine or ten horses in front of the approaching vehicle. Eduardo came to a slow rolling stop. What the fuck? You said they wouldn't suspect anything. Seth remarked from the back seat, removing his hands from behind his back and nudging his hostage forcefully with it through the back of the driver's seat. Eduardo, seeming to be caught off guard by the growing dilemma, tried reasoning with his captors, stammering his words about. I, I'm sure it is just precautionary. Yes, just act normal. Suddenly, all the men on the horses now before them pulled out handheld guns and aimed them at the vehicle. One of them pulled out a loudspeaker and began making an announcement in a thick Hispanic accent, lacking a full grasp on the English words as he spoke. Everyone out of automobile. No guns or we shoot the children. The words made Beck shudder as the images in front of her began to bear fruit to their aggressor's short monologue. The horses slightly parted and through the open middle came a white horse. It was Santiago. He was wearing black jeans and a white dress shirt and had several gold chains around his neck. As he smiled at the vehicle, everything seemed to happen in slow motion. He turned his horse to the side, giving his caught off guard adversaries a better view. And there behind him, upon the saddle, sat Caleb and Delilah, both of them scared, shaking and blindfolded. Beck started breathing heavily in fear for her children's lives. No, she cried in a hushed tone. A man behind Santiago dismounted his horse and approached the two kids. He gathered them up and placed them standing on the ground. Though they could not see anything going on, they each held a frightened face, petrified of what was taking place around them. Get out of the car, Eduardo. We're not leaving without them. It's you for them, Seth announced, depicting an intended trade. With that, the four of them began to exit the vehicle. Trevor and Beck made their way out with their hands high in the air. Seth followed Eduardo out, carrying his gun. Once a few steps in front of the Jeep, Seth began to attempt a negotiation, yelling to the small army across from them while aiming his gun at his hostage. It doesn't have to be like this. We've got something of yours. You've got something of ours. Let's make a deal. You'll never see us again. Santiago looked at his men around him, then looked back at Seth and chuckled. He then looked at Eduardo and praised him. Eduardo, you are a good man. Everything went as you and I had planned. Your task is complete. Thank you for your services. Beck and Trevor looked at each other, both coming to the same conclusion. It was a trap. It was a trap, and they walked directly into it. Then, as the realization of this plot washed over their faces, they each flinched and slightly ducked at the sound of a gun going off. Then, to Seth's astonishment, Eduardo fell to the ground, a bullet in his head, rendering his side of any deal null and void. The three looked over at Eduardo in horror, now laying on the asphalt, convulsing in his own last death throes. A man behind Santiago, on one of the horses, cocked his still smoking pistol and gave a nod to his boss. Santiago looked at him, then back to Seth. I don't make deals with cattle. Now, put gun on ground. Seth looked lost. He couldn't believe the ruthlessness of it all as he froze, failing to heed Santiago's warning. With that, Santiago pulled a gun of his own from his back and aimed it at the kids and fired. Beck fell to her knees, crying. No, as she looked up, she noticed it was just a warning shot at their feet. Both of the kids were now terrified, in tears and crying aloud and calling for their aunt Beck to rescue them. Seth, Beck cried, trying to snap her friend out of his daze. 
Seth looked over while coming out of his shocked stupor and immediately placed the gun on the ground. As he did so, the man that once stood near the kids walked up and grabbed the gun off the ground. Then he looked at Seth, meeting him eye to eye as Santiago spoke up once more. Joseph was a good man, he shouted, reminding the three about Joseph's fate while in their possession. He worked for me for many years before Paco recruited him. He was like a son to me. You poisoned him, turned him on us. It is time you learn how the Beltran Leva deal with enemies like you. Now you find out how I deal with enemies like you. The way my great grandfather, Arturo Leva, dealt with his enemies. Santiago then gave the three a menacing glare as the two children were promptly placed back upon his horse. He slowly disappeared through his men and receded into the darkness while his young hostages' cries grew faint. Seth looked at the man in front of him and without warning was met face to face with the butt of the gun he had just placed on the ground earlier. An excruciating blow to the head forced him to the ground, his surroundings immediately darkening as he passed out. He could hear the screaming and shouting of Beck, Trevor, and the children echo within his mind, mixed with a loud ringing in his ears from the blunt force trauma to his skull. Indiscernible conversations took place as all the noises faded out slowly to a deafening silence. He could see his dad's face within the darkened recesses of his mind. Eventually, his father's entire body began to take form as a very familiar playground behind him took shape. His father kept getting closer and closer as he felt a sensation of pure enjoyment envelop him. Thomas grabbed onto the chains on either side of Seth and pulled him toward him and then pushed him once again, high up in the air on the playground swing set. They were both laughing hysterically. Suddenly, Seth was at a picnic table with his parents. He could remember every detail of his seventh birthday party as he blew out his candles. His mom and dad cheered for their boy, now one year older. It was one of his fondest memories when his parents were still together. We will always love you, Seth, his father told him as his mom took her cue to add on. We are so proud of you. Then, suddenly, out of place, and not part of his memory. His parents vanished from view as the skies went black as a storm began to grip the setting in a darkening gloom. The picnic table was now gone and the heavens grew more intense as a downpour struck him with an unrealistic pounding of rainfall. He then woke up lying in the mud face down. He looked up right in time to see another bucket of water drench his face and body. It was unsettling only being able to feel around him, unable to see anything as the water splashed across his entire line of sight. Finally, as the water was swept away by gravity, he wiped his eyes as his surroundings began to take place. It was still dark and had not been too long since he went unconscious. He quickly realized they hadn't moved since being caught. He was lying face down on the road they were recently driving on with Eduardo. A two-story home blocked a small alleyway to his right. He could see, across a small patch of dirt and mud, Trevor and Beck both sitting and bound together. They were back to back, their heads turned toward him, each of them gagged, looking on in horror. He felt his feet tied together, but his hands were loose. He tried to gather himself up by leaning on his forearms, but was met with a violent knee to his spine, forcing him back to the ground. The man then knelt over and began to talk to Seth in a whisper. It was Santiago. My brother is how you say, faint of heart. I mean, sure, he can kill a man, but he always makes it too quick. I guess management can do that to you. Soften you up, eh? Me, I like to take my time, he said, as he used a gun as an extension of his arm and signaled to Beck and Trevor. I also like to have an audience. With that, he took his knee from Seth's back and changed position to stand in between him and his horrified friends. 
He could see Beck was crying, and Trevor was trying to shout his repudiations through his gag. He then heard the unnerving sounds of an engine being started up. Trevor and Beck's eyes grew in sheer horror as they were now both trying to scream their pleas through their gags. To understand the threat that his friends were seeing, Seth flipped to his back to find himself tied by chains, attached to a running vehicle. Trevor was trying to say something, anything, to make Santiago reconsider. If only he could switch places with his friend, he would tell Santiago exactly that, he thought to himself. He could feel the fear sweep through his best friend as Seth realized what was about to take place, his eyes growing with utter fear and confusion. Santiago looked back at Beck and Trevor and smiled. Then he looked back at Seth, who was trying to get his ankles loose from the metal chain. He just laughed as he said his goodbyes to Seth. Adios, muchacho. Trevor and Beck, now both letting out muffled screams and crying, closed their eyes and grimaced to the sound of Seth's painful shrieks as his body was pummeled across the jagged terrain, slowly fading into the dark distance. And just like that, Seth was gone. Only the sound of the roaring engine muffling his screams fading away. Santiago turned and walked up to them, kneeling by their sides as they shed tears for their friend's slow, painful death actively taking place in the distance. So, what was the plan? You come in as Eduardo's prisoners, and he takes you to me, eh? You use me as a hostage to get your kids back? You know, for a moment, you guys really had me and my brothers worried. Honestly, I didn't think my plan was going to work. But you cattle, you are so tied to your loved ones, not willing to just let go. He continued speaking over their muted anguish. Didn't it seem all too easy? Your ticket into my town, just sitting there on a hill, sleeping, waiting to be taken. Once my brother figured out it was you who killed Kent and his men, I knew you'd want your kids back. So now you can have them back. Santiago snapped his fingers. Beck and Trevor watched as the back door of a nearby truck opened the two kids being escorted out of it. Not blindfolded anymore, they saw Beck and Trevor and ran up to them. They embraced the pair on their knees, crying out their names. Trevor and Beck, bound at the wrists, were unable to embrace them back, but felt comforted by the short reunion nonetheless. Then, suddenly, two men grabbed them and drugged them away as Beck yelled through her gag, crying and pleading with Santiago and his deranged men. They could not see what the men were doing, however, as they were turned away from their view. Finally, the men parted, and Caleb and Delilah came into focus, each of them wearing a noose around their heads. Santiago looked at Beck and leaned into her. Now you get to watch them die. Beck looked at him, only able to make out bits and pieces of his face as her tears became too much to see through. Suddenly, to her complete and utter shock, the face she was looking at, the face of this gangster they call Muerte, was ripped from its bones as blood went everywhere. Gunfire began rapidly taking place. The jungle momentarily lit up in a fiery blaze of several machine guns dispatching their ammunition across the cartel congregation. Santiago's detached jaw fell from its bone structure onto her lap as he collapsed to her side. She closed her eyes and grinded her teeth around her gag, waiting for a bullet to do the same to her as the once, somewhat quiet field around them quickly turned into a war zone. The gunfire kept going for several minutes as she heard several men yelling in Spanish. She could hear the sounds of horses and the ground tremble from their flurry. She could feel her brother up against her back, shuddering as well, neither of them understanding the evolving drama around them. Slightly behind her, she could hear and feel a horse take an unfortunate fall as it came crashing to the ground. Slowly the gunfire came to a stop as Trevor and Beck looked up. The kids, now free from their captor, still with nooses around their necks, 
once again ran up to them. They sat there, bound, not understanding the gravity of what had just happened, and took in their surroundings while Delilah and Caleb embraced them. The small neighborhood dirt road around them was now filled with several dead cartel soldiers. A few horses had met their demise as well. One of them, its lifeless carcass atop a deceased man still clutching a pistol. Throughout the dirt road and small fields around it, bodies and entrails dotted the surface, blood glimmering under the dancing lights from nearby torches. Along the ground, small red dots from distant sniper weaponry darted from this way to that. Suddenly, from the shadowy distances on either side of them, military soldiers, all in dark fatigues, ran out of the darkness up to the survivors. All of them were moving with stealth, not speaking, wearing night vision masks, aiming their weapons at Trevor, Beck, and the panicked children. Eventually, they were surrounded by dark military figures standing around them while others secured the perimeter as one of them knelt beside the four startled survivors. Trevor immediately identified the patch on the shoulder of the officer kneeling in front of them. It was an American flag. A small sensation of relief flushed through his body. The soldier then removed her mask. She was carrying a small toolbox with a familiar red medical symbol on it and placed it at her side. She looked at the four and pulled a scanner from her kit. While she scanned Delilah, she began giving directions to her fellow officers. This one's clean, she said as another officer grabbed Delilah and separated her from the other three. She continued to scan the group as Trevor and Beck's confusion only kept growing. Clean, clean, clean. With that, a few more officers began freeing Trevor and Beck from their bounds. The officer with her mask off looked at Trevor and Beck as they rose to their feet. The kids ran to Beck and grabbed her by her hands and hid behind her. Trevor stood close to his three family members, confused and looking to the officer for some answers of what was going on. The unmasked soldier looked at the two hiding kids, then to Beck and Trevor and began speaking. While her fellow officers watched the dark distances for any signs of approaching cartel. You guys are clean. No parasite detected. Consider yourselves lucky. The water they provide the prisoners here contain a parasite. A microscopic worm that eventually makes its way to the brain. The human body repels it for a while. But after weeks or even months of relentless, watery intrusions, they begin to break through the body's defenses. Then, slowly, it takes over essential parts of your minds, rendering the person infected nearly catatonic. The two then thought of how everyone in the Chancellor's possession acted like they were in a trance-like state. Beck thought of the people within the cages of Paco's yacht and Trevor thought of the ones that were just standing and looking on with no appearance of any emotions as his late friend Eugene lost his life at the hands of two Russian soldiers. She then carried on with her warning. It makes them more obedient. But it also forces dormant traces of the virus that caused the pandemic years ago to resurface. Only this time, it's much more contagious, spreading quickly with the parasite along for the ride. So, if you come in contact with any water from these villages, do not drink it. Stick to boiling your water from rivers and streams. Now, this region is to be decontaminated by 0900. We're not in the business of rescuing the healthy. So, I suggest you move out before we finish our mission here. Trevor and Beck looked at each other, and then back at the speaking officer with more confusion. Finish? he asked, wondering what would become of all the cartel's innocent hostages. The Marine looked at him, and as if to speed up the unnecessary meeting taking place, without answering Trevor's question, reluctantly responded. There's a city about nine hours south of here, she said as she pulled out a map and handed it to Beck. Ponta Blanca. We can't help you get there. 
We still have a lot of work to do with these cartel camps. But if you make it there in two days, three sunrises from now, a United States military aircraft is going to be vacating healthy survivors. The vessel's name is Salvation. Beck looked at the female officer with a confused expression. Just like that, we're on our own. We have two small children, and most of our group have already been killed by these gangsters. There's no way we can make it. The officer rolled her eyes as if wishing to hurry this conversation to its end. Listen, lady, we have three things on our agenda we have to accomplish before salvation lands in two days. One, eliminate the Russian threat. Two, eliminate the cartel threat. And three, neutralize the parasitic virus. Now I'm not sure if you noticed, but rescuing survivors is not in our scope of tasks. We don't have room for recruits, let alone survivors. It's strictly against orders. Beck's face fell in despair as she slowly realized their nightmare wasn't close to over. The impatient Marine looked at Beck and made a half-attempt to console her. Look, the cartels and Russians have their hands full with us now. Besides us, there is only one target they're after. Some renegade outfit, I guess. Anyway, find a vehicle with plenty of gas and make it there. Stay off the highway. You're likely to be caught, she said as she gestured to the map Beck now held. Evacuation teams are taking everyone to an undisclosed location. A sanctuary. A hope for survival. Trevor looked over at the map Beck held and then regained his focus on the soldier. What's the one other target? You know, besides you. Trevor questioned, as the female officer put her mask back over her face and her team readied themselves for departure. Geared back up with her mask on and a medical kit and gun at her side, she let out a hushed sigh and answered Trevor, I don't really know. Our intelligence has come back with bits of information, but not much. They appear to be hell-bent on making amends with a leader of some group that infiltrated their town of Esmeralda. Apparently, this group dispatched one of their head trackers and a few of his men. Hung them from trees. Trevor and Beck's eyes widened. She kept speaking as her and her team began leaving the area, speedily moving on to their next objective. As they moved further away, the volume of her voice raised slightly, as to be heard from a growing distance. We haven't made our way to Esmeralda yet, so we're not exactly certain. But we do know the cartel leader was the infamous Lazar, goes by the Chancellor, now though. Used to have him locked up in Colorado. According to our sources on the ground, him and a few of his men are personally seeking this revenge. If you come across this group, stay clear of them. They have a death wish. It's not good to be on this gangster's mind. They're seeking the group's leader himself. Then finally, as the Marines began disappearing into the darkness, she shouted the final few words of her lengthy but hurried answer. I believe his name is Trevor Meeks.